Good afternoon. It's Friday, the 25th of September. I'm Erin Viner, and this is IVA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. We open with the announcement from Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan that he is prepared to present his latest selection as the nation's next commissioner of police in the coming days. The new top cop is believed to be currently serving as deputy chief of the Shin Bet Security Service, whose name remains under a gag order at this time. He is Erdogan's second choice and is believed to have received approval from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu earlier this week before Erdogan retracted his first recommendation, a former IDF commander, Gal Hirsch. Both Erdogan and Netanyahu agreed that the next commissioner must come from outside the police force. On Wednesday night, the public security minister announced that he decided to drop the appointment of Hirsch because of the long vetting process to which the Hirsch was subjected. Even though Erdogan and Netanyahu said that they still believe that Hirsch was the right man for the job, they both criticized the appointment process as being too difficult, too prolonged, and damaging. The Security Cabinet has unanimously approved a series of measures aimed at combating the current wave of Arab terror, which is typified by daily firebomb and rock attacks. Among the decisions is a change in the instructions to police, permitting them to open fire at suspects hurling rocks or using non-lethal sharpshooting guns whenever a danger is posed to anyone's lives and not just their own. A minimum jail term of four years has been set for adults convicted of throwing firebombs, rocks or other deadly objects, and fines will be increased against the parents of minors between the ages of 12 to 18 found guilty of engaging in terrorism. Prime Minister Netanyahu reiterated his assurance that the government will maintain the status quo on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem's old city, insisting that Israel has not and will not violate the sanctity of holy places of the faiths of any faith, including Islam, and that baseless lies are being spread by enemies of the state. Well, relations between Jordan and Israel are now strained over the violence in Jerusalem to the point where King Abdullah is reportedly refusing to even communicate directly with Prime Minister Netanyahu. According to articles in the Kuwaiti Al Jarida Daily, Abdullah even refused a request from the Premier to hold a secret meeting in Aqaba. Amman is not only apparently refusing to accept any back channel messages from the Prime Minister's office, but is also reportedly considering the recall of Jordan's ambassador to Israel. The king harshly criticized Israel earlier this week for police raids at the Al Aqsa Mosque compound to quell Palestinian riots. Following a diplomatic rift of more than two and a half months, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Reuven Rivlin met at the president's official residence in Jerusalem today for a routine briefing. Relations between the two have been particularly strained since Rivlin openly criticized Netanyahu for taking a combative stance toward U.S. President Barack Obama. During today's talks, the nation's leaders reportedly discussed recent political and regional developments as well as the ongoing battle against terrorism. Officials say that they have agreed to rejoin forces and work together in countering the mounting challenges facing the state of Israel. Renowned journalist and media personality Moti Kirshenbaum passed away this morning at the age of 76 at his home in Myth Moret, who just yesterday celebrated his birthday. The iconic presenter hosted his daily current events program, London and Kirshenbaum, alongside veteran journalist Yaron London on Channel 10 at the time of his death. He was among the founders of the Israel Broadcast Authority, who was rec recruited to return to the country from Los Angeles, where he'd been studying film, to take part in establishing the nation's first television channel. Among his many roles, Kirschenbaum served as the editor of the Mabat Hebrew News Program, as well as the producer of the popular cult satire program, Mikui Rosh, on Channel One, in which he also starred. Throughout his five-decade career, he also filmed many documentaries and movies. In 1993, Kirschenbaum was appointed as the head of the Israel Broadcast Authority, in which he served for four years. During that time, he was awarded the prestigious Israel Prize for his work in radio, television, and cinema. The Journalists Association awarded Kirschenbaum with a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2009, along with his colleague, your own London, and idiot Akronot journalist Sever Plotzker for their contribution to Israeli media. The time and date of Kirschenbaum's funeral has not yet been announced. Israel Television Channel 1 will dedicate tonight's schedule to Kirschenbaum's work broadcasting several films and programs in his memory. Everyone here at IBA News joins me in extending our deepest condolences to the Kirschenbaum family for their loss. 
In other news, top diplomats from Europe, the United States, and Russia have been jostling to lay out their positions on how to best end the civil war in Syria. During next week's opening of the United Nations General Assembly, one central issue of discussion among world leaders will be how and whether to include Syrian President Bashar al-Assad in any talks about the future of his country. Envoys in Washington say that the administration of U.S. President Obama is refusing to negotiate over a Russian plan that it fears could strengthen Assad's hand at the U.N. Efforts to stem the long-running crisis are gaining urgency in Europe, which is divided over how to deal with the mass influx of refugees fleeing the war zone. Moscow is, meanwhile, bolstering its military support of Damascus, just as Washington's support for opposition fighters is floundering. Russian President Vladimir Putin has repeatedly announced that in his nation's view, the only way to avoid another Libya is for Assad to remain in control of the Arab Republic. British Foreign Secretary Philip Hammond is, however, outright rejecting that notion. We've been clear that we think Assad cannot be part of Syria's future. We are perfectly prepared to consider a role for him during the transition, so long as it is clear that at the end of the process he will depart and allow the new Syria to be built without him. The German government has reportedly agreed to make a one-time payment of 4.1 billion euros next year to help 16 regional states cope with the record influx of refugees. German Prime Minister Angela Merkel met with the state's premiers at a summit on the crisis to discuss additional strategies to assist the local governments which are struggling to look after an estimated 800,000 people seeking asylum this year alone. And in a very macabre twist of fate, some migrants are now actually seeking refuge at the site of the former Nazi concentration camp of Dachau. Children can now be seen playing at the one-time place of fear and death at the camp's herb garden. The complex isn't part of the current memorial, although during the Holocaust, inmates were forced to spend hours in the cold and the rain to cultivate plants intended for medicinal use. Even though use of the site is sparking controversy, limited housing availability combined with rising numbers of refugees led the local authorities to utilize this option. The Third Reich set up Dachau just outside of Munich just weeks after Adolf Hitler rose to power, initially intended for the detention of his political rivals. It then became the prototype for a network of concentration camps. More than 41,000 people died at Dachau. Turning to the Iranian nuclear issue and the director of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Yuki Amano, has now well, confirmed that time. Iranians Certainly did indeed conduct environmental sampling the at the Parchin military the complex building, where nuclear activity for military purposes is suspected of having taken place. Amano shrugged off critics that are questioning the wisdom of allowing Tehran's own personnel to collect material aimed at determining whether their own country clandestinely worked on atomic arms, and said that he is convinced that the, pri the process is faultless. He went on to say that the Iranians are under stringent monitoring by his United, United Nations watchdog organization, and that he's confident that the samples are genuine. A report on the final assessment of the allegations is scheduled to be presented on December 15th, and is expected to help establish whether or not sanctions imposed against Tehran over its nuclear program will be lifted. U.S. Republican leaders are slamming the collection process, saying that it not only amounts to purely self-inspection, but is also emblematic of what they say has been unnecessary concessions to Tehran made in the July 14th pact. Amano is also rejecting that criticism, insisting that through the monitoring of state-of-the-art video, photography, photography, and global positioning, the IAEA is very sure that the integrity of the process is assured. He declined to comment and confirm or deny on Iranian claims that none of his agency's personnel were even present for the collection of the material at Parchin. Joining me now in the studio to discuss the latest regional developments is Bloomberg's senior correspondent, Kalev Ben David. Hi, Kalev. Thank you for coming in this afternoon. Pleasure to be here, Aaron, as always. All right, as you know, Netanyahu, actually the Prime Minister of Israel, flew to Moscow mm. or outside of Moscow for meetings with Russian President Vladimir Putin this week. How solid are the understandings that these two leaders gained over Russia's military presence, escalating presence in Syria? Well, we don't know the full details of uh, what they agreed to. Uh, so reports are that uh, Putin did assure Netanyahu that Russia's uh, flights, uh, you know, they're moving 
planes into serious uh, reports from the Pentagon. They're building a forward air base that if there uh, were going to be Russian flights, it would be limited in the area around that base that's uh, Latakia, uh, uh, near the, the coast, the Mediterranean right. coast. That Basel and that's, base. Right, and not close to the area where Israel reportedly has been carrying out airstrikes and has been carrying out open military action, which is on the Golan Heights side, uh, Syrian side of the Golan Heights. But the truth is, Aaron, we really don't know at this stage what are Russia's intentions, and it may really not be clear even to Russia how deeply it wants to get involved in Syria. If it really is just the case where Russia is looking to protect its own military assets near that Syrian Mediterranean coast, then it will probably not be a big factor. But if the relationship between Assad and uh, Russia deepens and the military relationship and Russia becomes committed to keeping him in power, that will have to involve a broader military presence by Russia uh, in Syria, in, for example, the Damascus area, where Israel, again, reportedly has been carrying out military strikes to prevent arms smuggling to Hezbollah, and there it could be involved. So I think, I'll go, I think a lot of the situation is still unclear, and I think the, the Israel, this is going to be a source for concern. Concern for Israel and Netanyahu going forward, if they say Russia, if they see Russian military involvement really deepening in Syria, it seems that this very issue is now really coming to the forefront, given the influx of refugees, yeah. but also the whole role that Assad will play, and it does appear to be a main topic of conversation that will come up at the United Nations next week for the opening of the General Assembly. Is there any chance, in your view, given the situation right now as we're looking at it, that the West and Russia can overcome their differences on what role Assad will play? I mean, of course, it's possible, but clearly there is a diverge, a serious difference of opinion here. Uh, Russia not only has shown no signs of backing away from Assad, though period periodically we do hear unconfirmed reports that have never been uh, come to fruition that said that Russia is uh, moving away from Assad, but in fact they've really doubled down on Assad uh, in recent uh, months with their military uh, bringing in their their own military into play right. into Syria. Uh, Reports again that maybe Obama, uh, President Obama, and the on Europe are becoming maybe a little softer in their view of Assad, conceding, as we heard uh, Hammond, the uh, UK Foreign Secretary, that Assad will have a role to play in the transition, and who knows how long that transition could uh, would take place. But clearly, just uh, looking towards the end game of a uh, Syrian agreement, which I still think is unlikely at this at, at this point. Yeah. Uh, clearly, there is a major difference of opinion. So I don't see any movement there. All right, let's stay at the UN, but switch topics. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is expected to meet with U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. Yeah. What are they likely to discuss? Sure, I think. You know, the, the United States, uh, the White House, and the U.S. ambassador in Israel, Dan Shapiro, have openly complained that the prime minister has not been willing to discuss uh, security, new security arrangements to go into to st looking forward after the implementation of the Iran agreement. And the prime minister's office has said, we want to wait. Uh, we don't want to give up the game until really the final uh, act is played out in Congress. Well, that's happened now. We yep. know it's not even coming to a vote because the White House got enough votes to even prevent uh, in, the, in the Senate to even pre pre uh, prevent a, an up and down vote on the agreement. So I believe at this point the uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is ready to start a serious discussions with the U.S. and Secretary Kerry about new security arrangements. We don't know the, any details of that, but certainly Israel is going to come maybe with its own shopping list of some U.S. military hardware, especially related to the uh, F-35 stealth bomber, which is the big ticket item that Israel would like to have, would like to uh, get upgrades on, on technology. And that probably certainly will be one of the things I imagine that Prime Minister Netanyahu will be shopping for when he meets uh, with Kerry next week. Okay, and what about the Palestinians? They're going to be raising their flag for the first time. Apparently, Abbas has been out making a lot of uh, speeches about trying to get the peace process back on track. But with all of the pressing, urgent world issues going on right now, 
Will much be done to put pressure on reviving this peace process, in your view? In, w in one word, no. Yeah. I don't know how much I really have to explain that. It's, it's exactly as you said, and we see the flailing of Mahmoud Abbas. Every other day we're hearing a new thing. He's resigning. He's not resigning. He's <laughs> going to go to the UN and dismantle, say the Oslo is over and he's dismantling the Palestinian Authority. No, then we hear another report. He's not going to do it. Clearly, the Palestinians are a little flummoxed right now about what. What they got, what to do uh, to get the world's attention back, and it's a problem because right now they're being overshadowed. Europe's attention is really elsewhere, certainly mainly on the Syrian refugee yes. issue. All right, back here at home. Now that these new government directives appear to be gaining momentum and close to becoming law, what do you make about these new measures, particularly the one about opening fire? Is this the pro at rock throwers or firebomb throwers? Is this the proper response to try to quell this? mass violence we've been seeing lately? Well, certainly the government thinks so, and they feel that basically uh, they've let a situation develop where uh, Palestinians, especially younger Palestinians, feel that they can throw rocks and firebombs, which can't turn fatal, as we saw what happened in Jerusalem last week when a, when a driver reportedly ran off the road and, and, and died in an accident. Right uh, below my balcony. That's right, and also in my neighborhood. So we yeah. know these, these yes. incidents can be fatal, and uh, the prime minister is trying to send out a message and even just uh, uh, coming out with this statement may have some kind of deterrent effect, especially on parents that may be less willing to send minors out to carry out. But Israel has to be very careful because if you're going to start hearing reports of teenagers, minors, maybe even as young as 12 years old because these new regulations also deal with the imprisonment and fines for 12-year-olds, even younger. If you start hearing those fatalities, that uh, pressure is, international pressure is certainly going to be coming on Israel, and certainly the media is going to, international media is going to jump on that. So the police are going to have to use a lot of discretion despite getting this new uh, latitude. Kalev Ben David, always good to have you with us. Thanks for coming in today. Pleasure as always, Aaron. Shabbat shalom to you and all the viewers. Well, as the Muslim world marks the Eid al-Adha holiday, the Central Bureau of Statistics has released the latest information about the community's demographics here in Israel. There were 1,454,000 Muslims at the end of 2014, reflecting an increase of 33,500 above the previous year. The overall growth rate is showing a decline from 3.8% in 2000 to 2.4% in 2014. But nevertheless, the community is still the fastest growing sector in the country since the Jewish rate is just 1.9%, the Christians are at 1.6, and the Druze at 1.5. The largest concentration of 303,000 Muslims live in Jerusalem, representing nearly 21% of the community. Saudi King Salman bin Abdulaziz has ordered a review of the kingdom's plans for the annual Hajj pilgrimage in the wake of the deaths of 700 people that were trampled to death outside the Muslim holy city of Mecca. The monarch has also ordered a swift investigation into the incident, which also injured at least 800 others. A stampede occurred when two large groups of pilgrims arrived at a crossroads in the city at the same time en route to performing the traditional stoning of the devil ritual. The disaster is the worst to happen during the Hajj since 1990 when more than 1,400 pilgrims suffocated to death in a tunnel near Mecca. Staying with the arts, uh, moving to the arts rather, and this is for all of you cinema lovers out there. The 31st Annual International Haifa Film Festival is set to kick off tomorrow night at the Cinematheque and other theaters across the northern Mediterranean city. The 10-day event features dozens of screenings and premieres while hosting more than 80 of the world's most distinguished filmmakers and other industry professionals. Legendary director Claude Lanzmann, best known for his epic documentary on the Holocaust, Shoah, is the esteemed guest of honor at the festival where he will be awarded with the prize for lifetime achievement. Noted Iranian film director Mohsen Makhmalbaf will serve as the chairman of the jury and other top directors from Italy, the United Kingdom and Lithuania are set to show off their works and also lead workshops and lectures. That's the International Haifa Film Festival open from the 26th of this month until the 5th of October. 
Turning to finance and the shackle ended the trading week with a mixed performance against all major foreign currencies. And due to the closure of the stock market on Fridays, here's a look at the closing numbers for the week. The IBA weather team tells us to expect a beautiful autumn day tomorrow with fair skies and no significant change in temperatures. Here's the forecast of home and abroad over the next 24 hours. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. We hope you'll join us again tomorrow when I'll be back with the latest breaking news from Israel. I'm Aaron Viner wishing you a great evening and Shabbat Shalom from Jerusalem.